to the virtual book launch of Be Bold, How to Prepare Your Heart and Mind for Racial Reconciliation by Latoya Burrell. My name is Eric W. Clavel, and I will be your moderator tonight. I am the director of the Center for African American Public Policy at Norfolk State University. And we thank you so much for joining us in this virtual book launch for this very important topic. The year 2020 has revealed so much in our country. It has revealed so much in all that we do. But one thing that it has revealed, it's revealed the inequalities that we have in our society. One of the searing images that we have and that we experienced in 2020 was the unfortunate killing of George Floyd at the hands of law enforcement. For those over eight minutes, the world saw a man breathe out and could not breathe back in. We saw a man that lost the will to live after calling out for his mother. And we heard him give a phrase that is the heartbeat of all persons that have been oppressed or discriminated against. And that's simply, I can't breathe. I can't breathe became the symbol for many individuals in our country that have spoken about discrimination, that have spoken about a lot of things that are not right in their lives. With that, many individuals have stepped up to the plate to discuss race, inequality, and also inequity. One of those persons is Latoya Burrell. Latoya Burrell is currently the Dean of the Graduate Education and Accreditation at North Central University. As a licensed attorney who graduated from Southern University Law Center, her career has included practicing law and teaching and leading in higher education. She has a passion for social justice and her research and writing interests have included Americans with Disability Law, Leadership, Ethics, Personal Empowerment, and Higher Education Law. Her new book on racial reconciliation, Be Bold, How to Prepare Your Heart and Mind for Racial Reconciliation, officially released in October of 2020. Living and working in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the book was inspired after the tragic death of George Floyd. She believes that when the true exploration of self and healing began, we can all boldly walk into our purposes. This exploration would lead to listening and learning. Listening and learning requires courageous conversations and an open heart and mind. Change will not take place until we come together and find common ground, one discussion at a time. Latoya believes that after boldly having the courage to have these discussions, racial, reconciliation can truly begin, starting with examining our hearts and our minds. The Burrell 4L formula for being bold equals loving, listening, learning, and most importantly, leading. Everyone, please welcome Latoya Burrell. Latoya, it's so good to have you. So glad to see you tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm really appreciative of your warm welcome. Wonderful. Well, you know, one thing that we all are anticipating is what led you to write this book, especially in this time period in which we live? Be bold. What led you to that? So there's no other way to put it. What led me to write this book was the killing of George Floyd. So living and working here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I had a front row seat for everything that was going on. And in the aftermath of the death, I continue to get phone calls from my friends and family members from all across the country asking me, what can I do? How can I help? And in essence, they wanted to know what was it like on Ground Zero. They wanted to know if what they were seeing on the news was an accurate reflection. 
And so for me, I, I felt for the first time in my life, a different response. Sure, this is not the first time that I've seen an injustice, but this was the first time that I felt a different response. I felt a call to action like none other. And I thought that there's something that I must do. So I made a Facebook live video that day. I'm not that active on social media. So it was my first Facebook live video. And I said to my viewers, I said, if you know me, you know, I'm a person who value accountability. I'm very driven. And I have this sense of, and the word I use was conviction. I have this sense of conviction. There's something that should be done. In that moment, what that something was, I didn't know. So that weekend, I made a video on YouTube called Here's What You Can Do. And to be honest, I thought that was me being obedient. I thought I've made this video. My work is done. Little did I know my work was only beginning. And then started to make these videos on YouTube that I called the Listen and Learn series. And I began to get calls from people who I haven't seen since high school asking me for resources. And if I would mind having a call with them, my neighbors were reaching out asking me if we, if me and my husband would have an opportunity to sit with them and just discuss from our vantage point. And then I began to have sleepless nights. And that is when the book was birthed. So I, you know, I, I, I feel that this book was catapulted by the death of George Floyd, the location, uh, my proximity, as well as us all being home right now with COVID-19. I think we had a lot of time to listen, to learn, and to dream. And I'm just so thankful that God placed it on my heart for me to actually put these words on paper and get this message out to the world. Wow. We thank you so much for being obedient. And I know that a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of Americans were uh, tossing and turning regarding this issue, but not really knowing where to turn or what to do. But now we have Be Bold. Tell us, what is this book about? This book is about racial reconciliation. And for me, I'm a person, I talk so much about my Gallup Five strengths and one of my Gallup Five strengths is harmony. So I'm a person who I like harmony. I know it may seem odd, I'm a lawyer. I say it, I don't want to just argue with you for the sake of arguing. If I have to go to court and argue with you in a fair way, I will do that, but I like harmony. So usually racial reconciliation is a topic that causes people to be uncomfortable. It causes tension. And nonetheless, there are all, always people on different sides. Everyone doesn't see it the same way. We all don't define racial reconciliation, harmony, justice, or any of those things the same. So that causes tension. And for me, that normally would cause me to just shut down. It's like, if, if it's not harmonious, I don't wanna move forward with it. So this book is about racial reconciliation from the lens of harmony. I truly believe that racial reconciliation begins with us actually exploring ourselves and examining our hearts. I believe that any form of injustice is a matter of the heart. So whether it's racism, sexism, classism, any of the isms, I believe that they are matters of the heart. So I think the first step is you actually examining your heart and in the video that I created on YouTube, as well as the book, I say the four steps that you can take to, to get to racial reconciliation is first, examine yourself, then you listen, you learn, and you be bold. So in the book, I, ex I expound on how you do those four things. Of course, the listening is not, is the question might be listen to what, listen to who. I say, listen to others, listen to the story of others, the stories of others, and share your story. For learn, I say you have to learn history because we can't get to a place of reconciliation without truth. And so knowing the truth is actually knowing the history. And, and even with that, I say to people, you know, you learn the history not to make you feel guilty or convicted because my statement is that history is not our fault, but the future and making a change is our duty. And then the final step is to be bold. But I'll say this, the book is called Be Bold. And I recognize, I say, it's not a cyclical, uh, it's, it's a cyclical, it's not a, a four-step process. It's cyclical. And so for some people, you actually buying the book might be you being bold. For some people, you saying, hey, I need to have this discussion about racial reconciliation. I'm uncomfortable. For some people, that is you actually being bold. And then I would say you take the steps and then you might at the end find yourself being bold again. And you sharing this information with all of the people in your sphere of influence uh, and your, your network and the et cetera. You know, many would say that talking is the start of solving a problem, but listening is the tool that you need in order to create the solution. So with that being the case, what do you really want to achieve from this publication when 
they get it in their hands, they read it. What do you want to see come out of that? I would like to see people have soften and change hearts and minds. It's okay if you thought you felt one way and then you get exposed to new information. And so you get exposed to new information and that may lead you to a change of heart and a change of mind. That change of heart and change of mind then can lead to different discussions that typically may be uncomfortable discussions. And then ultimately that leads to growth. It helps you to get past the fixed mindset and get to a place where you have a growth mindset. And I think that when we are willing to allow ourselves to stretch to that area, everyone benefits. Wow, absolutely amazing. The book is launched. It launched last month. Um, many people have it. We have many people attending now the virtual book launch. Um, what's been some of the feedback from those who have dared to be bold and open up and start reading? I've been so thankful for the early feedback. I'm so thankful for everyone who supported me in the pre-sale of this book. The official launch for the book technically was supposed to be yesterday, November 1st, but the book actually shipped about 10 days before that. So on the actual launch date, I had already had people who said, I've read the whole book. I've read half of the book. And the feedback, some of the feedback that I thought was interesting was someone asked me, would you consider making a study guide for it? Would you consider making some, just giving us a little bit more? Uh, and the feedback also has been positive in the sense that, again, I'm harmonious. I want this book to be for everybody. I don't want anyone to feel that this book is a sense of conviction for them. And I've been getting the question of, you know, I've learned something new. It, you, you said something in a book that I didn't know about. I'll give one example. I'm from Louisiana and in the history section of the book, I talk about slave codes. And so specifically I talk about one slave code that hit home for me, the Fleur de Lis. Uh, and that's a symbol that's heavily used in Louisiana. It's the symbol of the New Orleans Saints. We have it heavily as decor in my home. And then I found out that the Fleur de Lis was designed to brand slaves to show that they had run away. And I remember thinking, wow, the more you know. So that's one example that someone told me I didn't know that. So uh, I think that it's it's an opportunity for us to just stretch ourselves. And, and then the next piece of advice that I've been, uh, not advice, but feedback that I've been given is the, the 10 questions. The second half of the book is 10 questions. And I say, in addition to what can I do, I've often been asked, other questions, and I call those deflector questions. So what I do is I respond to each of those deflector questions, and I say I'm responding from my vantage point, but I want you to read this book with a growth group, and you listen to different perspectives. I'm only one perspective, and I would encourage everyone to make sure that you share your perspective and your stories, because those are the things that help us to grow, and it helps our hearts to get just a little bit softer. I tell you what, I can't wait to delve into it myself. And I'm pretty sure many others who are listening uh, that have joined us for this virtual launch or those that will click and rewatch it or one that they're wondering, you know, what's inside. If you don't mind, can you share just a little bit of it with us here? I absolutely can. I'm excited. It's exciting to finally have books in hand. I remember getting my first copy of the book and then now having more than one copy available. So I will read a little bit. So the introduction, maybe it's not fair for me to read this part because the introduction is actually available. So if anyone is watching and you have not purchased the book, you can read the introduction on Amazon. Uh, the Kindle version allows you to pre-read. So I'm going to read just a little bit from the introduction and then I'll read just other random sections of the book. So the question that I've been asked, how, how did you write this book? Uh, you're, it's the middle of a pandemic, you're at home, you have two small kids. And I'll give credit to someone who made a quote. I'm in a writing group on Facebook, go figure. And one of the people in the group, he said, it was a quote and he said, when I'm drowning in my emotions, writing is my life raft. And that's how I felt this summer. I felt coupled with being home with my two kids, with, you know, with COVID-19, writing became therapy for me. So in addition to writing this book, I did write other articles. So uh, the, the book opens by saying, God is truly at work when you begin to have sleepless nights because your mind is consumed with work to be done. As we close out the first and enter the second quarter of 2020, our world was shaken by the pandemic that changed life as we know it. Adjusting to the new norm included Zoom calls, homeschooling, limitations on gatherings, and simply watching the daily news reportings of the statistics of rising cases. 
It seemed like we were leaving a season of temporarily sheltering in place to the new norm of social distancing. And then our world was rocked when George Floyd was murdered after a police officer sworn to protect and serve kept his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. This sparked national, then global uproar as people took to the streets to protest in not only every single state in America, but in over 60 countries across the world. So why now are so many people of all races, ages, religions, and socioeconomic statuses coming together? What can I do? How can I be an ally? How can I have the uncomfortable conversation about race? The questions continued to come, but for the first time in my life, my response was different. I felt a call to action and the need to do something. I then go on in this section to talk about why I've been quiet in the past. I've had that question before. And I talk about as a black woman in America, we already as black women have the stereotype as angry black women. So as a harmonious person, my response to that would typically be to remain quiet. Uh, often uh, times people will say often, it's not just, I don't wanna be viewed as an angry black woman. But for me, it was also, I was comfortable also when we talk about stepping outside of your comfort or privilege, this is not just white people or not only the people who are privileged. I'm sitting in my comfort and I can look at some of the issues and injustices happening. And if it doesn't hit home for me, I don't feel the need to step out of my comfort zone. And then also you have some people who say, well, I don't want to compromise what I've worked for. What if my colleagues misunderstand what I'm saying? What if I compromise my job or any positions that I, I've acquired that I believe I've worked hard to acquire? So the response is typically to stay quiet. Well, I saw a Facebook post and it was a young woman who said, and I quote, I say this in a book, she says, I was often the quiet black girl because I didn't want to be viewed as the angry black woman. And she said, no more. And I remember sharing that Facebook post saying, wow, absolutely no more. So that's just a little bit from the intro chapter. And I'll read a little bit of the closing from the intro chapter. I say, it doesn't mean we can't attempt to dismantle racism and put a stop to systematic oppression. It does not mean we cannot or should not work towards racial reconciliation. To put a stop to systematic oppression, we have to continue to apply pressure and become educated about how and why systemic issues are remain issues in 2020. In the famous 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. And then I add, almost 60 years later, the statement still rings true. The comments and actions caused me to think long and hard. And I also think it's interesting with election day tomorrow, I make a comment that I stand by. I say politics keep us divided, but this problem is bigger than any political party. Politics is something to hide behind. This is a spiritual problem related to our hearts and our minds and our souls. So not sure how deep you wanted me to go, Eric, but I'll stop right there. <laughs> but I do have other little excerpts I can read and maybe it'll be appropriate to read at a different point. Right. Well, listen, I, I almost want to jump off and just dive right back into the book myself and finish it up. But we have a phenomenal panel of experts, legal experts, historians, academicians, and those that are really working as change agents here to join us. If you don't mind, I want to take a few moments just to introduce our panel, because I want us to engage in a discussion about racial reconciliation and where we are as a country, where have we been from a historical standpoint, and where we need to go. I mean, this is an important discussion, and I want to make sure we have all the bases covered before we start to really engage and take those next steps. So bear with me just a moment. And for those of you who are watching, if you have any questions that you want, want to ask, please start sending these in uh, and we'll make sure we get to them as we go through our, our discussion. But here we go, I want to delve right into it. We have Shaylee Agnihotri. She's the founder and executive director of the Restorative Center. It's a grassroots organization which advances and advocates for restorative justice to address profound issues of social disconnect. She spent more than 20 years as an attorney and has developed an expertise in criminal justice through working as a prosecutor in Orleans Parish, 
teaching at Georgetown Law School and Southern University Law Center, and as a public defender in New York City. Shaley has presented at conferences and universities around the world on her vision for an independent freestanding model for restorative justice. Everyone, please welcome Shaley Agnihotri. Thank you, Eric. And I'm so excited to be here for the book launch. Thank you, Latoya. Wonderful. We also have Robert Vischer. Robert Vischer is the Dean of the University of St. Thomas School of Law here in Minneapolis. He has a BA from the University of New Orleans and a JD from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. He also so clerk for three United States federal ju judges and practiced corporate litigation at the law firm from, of Kirkland and Ellis before entering the legal academy. His areas of research is law, religion, and professional ethics. He's published two books with Cambridge University Press entitled Conscious and the Common Good, Reclaiming the Space Between Person and State, and Martin Luther King Jr. and the Morality of Legal Practice, Lessons in Love and Justice. Dean Vicious, so glad to have you today. Great to be here, glad to be able to join the conversation. We're looking forward to it. And we also have Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. She is a historian, and I'll say historian of historians. She's currently the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. Dr. Alexander, uh, Nubi Alexander, her areas of research and scholarship are in areas of African-American history uh, during slavery and post-colonialism. She serves on many commissions, but most recently she served on the Virginia Governor's Commission for African-American History and recently helped to revamp the curriculum for African-American history in K through 12 schools here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Moreover, she is the co-founder of the Center for African-American Public Policy, where I serve as director. She is also the sole founder of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center that is responsible for the 1619, the Making of America Conference. This program was featured as one of the Virginia 400 year commemoration programs as the Making of America Summit. Additionally, she's been featured on Voices of America in over 100 countries and on C-SPAN. Please help me, and her, her accolades are too much to, to go through right now, but trust me, when I say historian of historians, she's also my big sister. Please welcome Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Thank you so much, Eric. You are very, very kind, and I am so delighted to be a part of this discussion. Well, Latoya, she mentioned the election, and I wanna start with a question about the election where we are with race and reconciliation. Now, politically, our country has gone through a transformation like no other since 2008 to 2020. We've had many firsts, many good firsts. And unfortunately, many old scars have been reopened. With an already divided country and an election on tomorrow, what can we do to facilitate reconciliation during such a divisive time? Dean, if you could start first, Dean Fisher. Sure. Um, well, I think first it's important to recognize that whatever the results of the election, the, the political tribalism that has gripped our country is not going away on November 4th. So this is still gonna be a challenge we have to face. Uh, one of the recommendations that, that I would have is to the extent that we can shift some of our gaze to local politics and local projects and local collaboration, I think that helps tremendously. We still have, even at the local level, our own cultural bubbles that we need to be proactive about uh, poking through and making sure that we're connecting with those outside our normal cultural and social circles. But I think the local is really the laboratory where we can explore what you know, Aristotle called civil friendship, where the purpose of politics is to be able to collaborate with our fellow citizens in pursuit of human flourishing. And what's the advantage of the local is that the collaboration can occur in the context of real relationship. When everyone is so transfixed by the presidential race as though our primary political responsibility is simply picking one of two candidates 
in a once every four years national election, that really short circuits how politics is supposed to function. It should be calling us outside of our own comfort zone to work on projects with our fellow citizens where we can see them face to face, where we can interact with them and thereby grow our own awareness of lived experiences that are different than our own. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that national issues are not important, they're absolutely important, but I think we've become a bit lopsided in our attention. Like if you compare the amount of attention that the average American has spent over the last year on presidential politics versus local school board races, local municipal races, state elections. I just think it's it's out of whack. And when we go that far to the national, we're really subverting the relational side, which just exacerbates because we're arguing and feeling alienated from people we don't even know. It's anonymous strangers on the internet and it just becomes a, a self-perpetuating cycle. So I would say if we can spend some time stepping back and reinvesting ourselves at the local level, I think that would be a step in the right direction. Cassandra, uh, Dean Fisher brings up a very good point where we should be working on the local level, but with every day we're inundated with messages um, over our electronic devices, uh, social media and the, and the news, our entertainment outlets, how can we focus our attention up on the common, back to the common man and in order to really address racial issues today? You know, one of the most important things in my mind is that we stop lying to ourselves about who we really are as a nation. Uh, people keep talking about tribalism in our country as if it's a new thing, as if we just started acting this way. We have been this way from the beginning. And so the first thing I think we have an opportunity to do is to first and foremost, walk into this new century as honest citizens of our country and to recognize that we are not united in so many ways. We are divided. But where, where do we have those commonalities? What ideas bring us together? We all want peace in some way. We all want certain things in our lives. We all want to protect our families. We all want to be in a safe environment. And if we begin to focus attention on how we are all connected as human beings and citizens of this country or as residents of this country, then we can begin to work together. And that working together, as Robert Fisher said, has to start at the local level. You know, we talk about how politics, all politics is local, but then when we get so fixated on national things that we don't seemingly understand that it, politics and our nation's healing and moving forward is also local. We can't transform the nation, but we can transform the world in which we live, our local communities. And then it has the potential to reverberate and to become a part of our national landscape. And so I'm interested in seeing that happen and for people to first start off with who we really are. So as a historian, I see this master narrative, you know, um, Ronald Takaki in his book, A Different Mirror, first started writing about, I believe it was published in 1991. He first started writing about this, this master narrative that focused on Europeans as not only the founders, but the only ones who are real Americans. And that narrative, that, that master narrative has really skewed who our perspective of who we are from the beginning all the way until now. And so if we could go back and begin to realign what actually happened with how we are teaching people about what actually happened, it will begin an important process of healing, of reconciliation, of learning about one another because our history begins to align with our facts. You know, Cassandra, we're going to delve into the historical part of it 
and really understanding who America is. You bring out a, a very good point. But I, but, but I want to ask the same question to Shaylee Agnahotri. You know, again, you've worked on the ground floor. Uh, you've worked with the restorative project and you've been around the world, Orleans Parish, Washington, D.C., and the like. You know, and you know what the political environment is like. Is it possible? How can we facilitate the reconciliation in this time period? I really appreciated what everybody has said so far. And I think I wanna sort of um, address the question that everybody's sort of posed from my vantage point as somebody who really wants to advocate for the process for these conversations that I believe everybody's talking about. Um, and I believe that we have to enter these conversations from a different doorway than the ones we've been entering previously. Um, we all, I mean, we, 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 we do forget who we are. We forget that we're all human beings on this planet spinning through space. We forget that we have, we share a sunrise, we share a sunset, we share the stars, we share the elements of this earth. We forget that and once we forget that, we forget who we are. And once we forget who we are, we forget who we are to each other. And therefore our institutions do not reflect who we truly are anymore because we're lost. So I think, you know, Latoya talked about the spiritual component. The Dean spoke about um, the deep, the, uh, he spoke about reclaiming that space. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of um, the historian. Uh, she, she spoke about um, the commonality. And, and what I want to address is that the restorative justice process, well articulated, can create a space for these very important conversations by reminding us not only through storytelling, but also um, through listening to each other's stories about um, our experiences on this planet to open hearts and minds, which is what everybody seems to be saying over and over again. I think we all understand that we want to do it and how we do it has uh, is been the question that I try to address in my work. And, um, and I believe that the conversations that I witnessed in a well-facilitated restorative justice circle process are a way forward to have these very important experiences. I would call them more experiences and conversations because the process of engaging with the self in relation to others in a new way, I'm sorry, I'm, I have a cold, so my voice is going, um, is, um, <clears throat> is um, I think the root of the ideas that, I would, that I've been working on. You know, many times when we turn on the television or we listen to individuals give their opinion, they're kind of to the extreme. And in this conversation, we talked about commonalities, you know, which, which brings me to think that there are some people that believe that we don't racial reconciliation or there's not a problem. Um, so I, I asked the question, is racial reconciliation needed in our country? I'll respond to that, Eric, and I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm showing up twice because, of course, my computer is acting up, but, you know, we figure it out. Uh, I will answer that question and say, I absolutely think that it's necessary and we know it, which is why people ask the question of what can I do? What can I do? How can I help? You ask that question because you know that there is something that's wrong and that there is something that has to be done. And so I think that reconciliation uh, can can only work though, and I think I've said this already tonight, reconciliation can only work if we're willing to acknowledge truth. And so and hence the truth and reconciliation. Um, I also think that the common trend of what we've said here tonight, which is a big part of why I didn't want this book release launch to just be me, a Q and A with me, because I think that it's important to have diverse perspectives. And so I think that it's even important to have at the table that person who doesn't think that reconciliation is necessary. Because I would love to be able to hear their perspective as to why they don't think reconciliation is necessary. And it's an important voice to have as a part of the discussion. You know, but you'll hear individuals say, oh no, you know, people are just complaining. Oh no, they're, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, but you mentioned also that there may not be a, that some may say there, there is a problem, others may say it's not. So I guess I, I, I wanna know, can we have racial reconciliation 
without a racial reckoning. Robert, what do you think? Well, yeah, no. Uh, and I think this is where the historians come in is because uh, we, we can't understand the need for systemic reform unless we understand the history. And until we get to that point, it's just like two separate worlds uh, looking past each other. So, you know, when I was growing up in school and we talked about, uh, and I went to a overwhelmingly very large white uh, public high school just outside Chicago and all growing up, in my understanding, the history of race relations in the United States consisted of slavery, which was solved by the Civil War. And then it, uh, it consisted of Jim Crow, which was solved by Martin Luther King Jr. And that was really it. And so it wasn't really until I was into adulthood that I got a much deeper understanding. And when you sit down with someone and actually walk through, okay, let's look at percentage of home ownership today among black Americans versus white Americans and the, uh, the net uh, median household wealth, which ties directly to home ownership. And then you walk that back through the history of redlining and restrictive covenants and all the rest it then starts to make sense. And you won't all agree on what the remedy is. Not every American is going to say, yes, we need reparations, or you won't agree on the, on the path of reform, but at least you start understanding that there is a problem. And I think part of the disconnect that we have is even admitting that we have a problem, that something should be done. And I, there's, there are multiple layers of the disconnect, but I think at the core, it's just, uh, Americans' uh, refusal to come face to face with history and how our history still shapes the present. So it's not complaining about long ago ages, it's trying to understand how the past history still shapes the current reality. And so that's why I think historians are at the center of what needs to happen. Cassandra, I think, I think Robert covered all five pages of African American history K through 12 that we all get in our public schools, right? Uh, just in like 60 seconds. So I was itching to get to this question to you when they mentioned a historian, because you, you were at the table. We, and you and I, we've had many, many long conversations about this, uh, but you were at the table here in the Commonwealth of Virginia with secretaries of education, with historians, with history teachers, combing through the pages and saying, you know what? We need to add more. We need to take this out. This is wrong. We need to tell the truth. So can we have a racial reconciliation without racial reckoning? Absolutely not. Um, our society really needs, as I said earlier, to come to grips with who it is, um, with how we have been. Um, I, you know, I'm 62 years old, so I have lived a, a long life and I have seen a lot of things occur. I grew up during segregation. I was still a child, an older child, when uh, widespread busing occurred. And I remembered um, going through the process of having white children see me a certain way because our society had been programmed to be disconnected. Most whites in the city that I grew up in, Norfolk, Virginia, had never ever been to the east side of the city. In fact, the city created a barrier, a physical barrier in the form of his roadways to ensure that two sides of the city existed and that those two sides very seldom came into contact with each, each other. And what I see today is that those same cities have never broken those barriers down. And so until you begin to break down those barriers, just as in, in Germany, they tore down the wall that separated the two. They commemorated that wall with a, a, a stone passageway that is built into the pavement that you don't see unless you look down and see it. 
But, but in America, we still have the walls. We still have our schools hugely segregated. 90% of our students in the South still go to segregated schools in many of the cities. And that should never be the case. We still have hugely unequal funding of schools. And so we expect children who come from poorer families to perform at the same level as those who come from wealthy families. So what we do is we give more to those who already have a lot and we give less to those who are already struggling. I work at a historically black university and our school was underfunded for 75 years. In that time period, the Commonwealth of Virginia decided, oh, well, we're going to reconcile that differential of funding by awarding the school $5 million. $5 million to take care of 75 years of underfunding. And then another governor came along and said, oh, we'll up it by $10 million. That's still pennies. You cannot purchase the kind of buildings and infrastructure with that kind of money that other universities who weren't underfunded had were able to put into place. And so that's what makes it difficult to be competitive. In addition, many of our students who are African-American, about 80 to 85% of our students are, they come from families who are still struggling. Many of our students are working full time to support their families, not just to support themselves, but to support their families. And we're expecting them to perform at the same rate as students who do don't have to worry about any funding whatsoever. And so when we come to the realization that the reckoning must happen now, that we must start putting things in place, regardless of what you call it, reparations, whatever, but we meet, need to start, first of all, addressing that. Because if I keep telling a person who's starving to get up and start moving and start working, and I'm not and I made sure that they were starving for years, then I'm not doing any good service to that individual. And I'm certainly being a hypocrite because I've deprived them. I have actually deprived them of being successful for a long time. Then I remove that deprivation but then I don't allow that individual a hand up to prepare them for what they need to be prepared for moving forward. And so that's where I see America. We have so much that we have to first deconstruct. We have to tear down these walls. We have to tear down these barriers. We have to tear down, for example, in most of the country, schools are funded based on your economic level. Why? Why are we unequally funding the schools? The reason that was put into place was to maintain segregation and inequality. And you can trace exactly when those laws were put into place and why they were put into place. And we have as yet to change that particular uh, approach. And so once we start doing that, then we can start talking about reconciliation. You know what, Cassandra, you bring up Many, many, many great points. But one thing that I heard throughout was equality and inequity. Inequity, and that's that's one word we we've talked about equality and inclusion. But in this time period in 2020, I've heard the talk of inequity over and over again. As a matter of fact, we have one of our participants who had a question uh, regarding what a clear picture of reconciliation looks like in order to embark on a journey. For example. They're asking, is reconciliation reparations? Or is there a consensus of what reconciliation looks like? Shaylee, what do you think? I think that the answers are not gonna come from the top down. I think that the idea that we're gonna create a new institution that's just gonna lord over us and tell us what the answers are, that's an old paradigm. I think the answers are gonna come from our conversations like we're having now that are gonna be intergenerational, 
uh, community-based holding space for all the wisdom that we have that is lying dormant. We are all, all in extremely wise human beings that have not been, that have, that our wisdom has not been engaged in a, in a way that has addressed the root issues of our lives. Um, and I think the time is going to come where we're no longer going to be um, asking others for the answers, but as uh, Latoya brilliantly said in her book, it's about starting the journey inside, really un uncovering not only our relationship to our history, but our relationship to the institutions that exist and thereby recreating, um, re answering the questions by asking them with each other. That's, I believe that, I, I believe that us declaring what the answers are is missing the most important part of this conversation, which is that we need to have a conversation. Um, and I just wanted to, and one more thing I just wanted to address is, I think one of the, one of the things that I've noticed in these conversations that I have been a part of about um, the history of this country and the, the, the reckoning and the reality and the truth is that people often confuse their um, personal racism because they feel they are not racist with the fact that we have farmed out our racism to institutions. So that there's often a disconnect about what is going on in the criminal justice system because I'm not racist. And so that there is this disconnect with the personal relationship, I love everybody, to the fact that in your name, a 16 year old kid is now in jail because he didn't have money to ride the subway to school. So there, there is a, um, that disconnect between the personal experience of being racist and the institutional effect of racism, which isn't in our names. We have to reclaim it. We have to reclaim our institutions and own what's being done for us in our name. Um, I think that that is an important conversation because it, that will open hearts because people really do not understand what is happening in some of these institutions, I believe. Latoya, you know, Shaley brings up another very important point, the journey beginning inside. But once the journey starts inside, there's got to be some product that comes out. So what does reconciliation looks like once the journey begins inside? Well, I absolutely think that that's a great question and also a good point. I do believe that it starts within. But again, as stated, I believe that you have to have a group of people to do this with. I think early on, there should be ground rules that are set. And it's also the understanding that it's not a one size fits all. So Dean Fisher mentioned early on about you know, you have in civil friendship and you looking at the local um, quote in Aristotle. And I think that we have to keep that in mind. So, and be open to thinking and understanding that reconciliation in one place may not be the same as reconciliation in another place, just because of the different experiences, just because of the different cultures, just because of the different people and the different things that have taken place and have happened. I think when we look at our country overall, and even though we can talk about the South and the Civil War, and we can talk about the North and Jim Crow of the North, uh, like that documentary that I, I talk about this documentary in my book also, so eloquently points out via redlining and other things like that, reconciliation in the South may not look the same as reconciliation in the North. Reconciliation in a community that is predominantly white may not look the same as a community that has a heavy population of minorities. But I think what we have to, the consensus has to be that we understand that there is work to be done and the work is gonna be internal as well as ex external. We have to understand that that reconciliation may not be comfortable for everyone. Uh, and one other thing that I like to point out is I've been on this journey of exploring the truth and reconciliation commissions that have taken place all across the world with the exception heavily to the United States of America. And I think it's interesting that if you study South Africa and after apartheid, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as it's entering right at about 25 years, and there are some who believe that it wasn't effective and others who believe that it was effective, but then also studying other places that have actually had Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. And for me, just that reality that we've never had that as a country when it comes to slavery and some other injustices that have taken place. It was a matter of, okay, we have this 13th Amendment and now you're free, but then we had Jim Crow laws. And then we get to the civil rights era and around 1965, the mid sixties, it's like, okay, well, this is no longer legal. So you're free, 
but then in reality, we're not, and we've never taken the time to actually address it. So I guess a long answer to her question uh, that was posed uh, in, the, in the chat is, it's not a one size fits all, but one thing is for sure is going to take a commitment. And the final thing I'll add to that is I say to people that reconciliation and this hard work around uh, racial reconciliation in general is like anything else. So when I get the, I've, I have, I've had people before say to me, I just don't know what to do. So it's not the, what can I do? They're like, I just don't know what to do. It just seems hopeless. And I say, just like anything else that you've worked for in your life, whether it be a, G, a GED or a PhD or a JD, for those of us on this call, you had to work for it. You had to make a commitment for it because it's something that mattered to you. Racial reconciliation is no different. Reconciliation is no different. It has to be something that you believe is worth your time, your energy, and your effort, and you're willing and able to put that energy and effort into it to, to see a change. Robert, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to add to, to what Latoya said. I, speaking as a white person, I think the path to reconciliation also requires uh, us to recognize that we need reconciliation as well. The the, the disconnection, the alienation has harmed us as well. One thing that Dr. King always spoke and wrote about was segregation was hurting white people and black people. He said the, the white man's soul is greatly scarred by segregation. And I remember when I, you know, I said, grew up just outside Chicago in an overwhelmingly white suburb that was right next to overwhelmingly black suburbs. And I went down to school uh, in the South and I remember freshman year, my roommate, who was from a little town in North Louisiana, and we had late night conversations where with all the self-righteousness that only an 18 year old can muster, I would lecture him about, you know, the racial politics of the South. And then he would turn it around and start asking me some pointed questions about, well, you know, how many black students did you have in your graduating class? And why do you think the suburb next to yours uh, was predominantly black and yours was almost exclusively white? Why, and all these things that, that caused me to think, wait a second, I'm, I'm really quick to point the finger here. And then as I went deeper into it, also recognizing what I had lost from that. And so part of this reconciliation, I think it, it need for it to be sustainable, it can't come from a place of shame and guilt. It, it has to come from a, from a recognition that in the end, it's about restoring relationships. Now, there might be some systemic reforms that are necessary to support authentic restoration of relationships, but it also has to be at the relational level, which is hard because geographical segregation has made it very challenging in many places in the United States to go out of your own enclave and your bubbles. But part of reconciliation is recognizing what you have lost because of that, because we have segmented ourselves like this. And so it hopefully will be motivating when you realize that you're, you've cut yourself off from the richness of God's creation by saying, I want to spend my days and work and study with people who look like act like and increasingly vote like me because this has kind of infected the political tribalism that we're, that we're dealing with as well. You know, Robert, uh, you, you've kind of started the, the explanation to the question I really wanted to start with you about. And I look around and I'll give you a perfect example. When I, when I met my golf club or we're out in an area of white privilege uh, males and uh, who are in America and I asked myself, you know, can, are these individuals ready to sacrifice, you know, their privilege to help individuals that they really don't come in contact with? You know, so, you know, with equity, with history, the lack of true history uh, being taught in schools and the rhetoric and that, that we're hearing spewed across different airways, you know, can racial reconciliation really be achieved? Well, I sure hope so, <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't view it as something where we say, aha, we finally achieved reconcilia reconciliation. Our work is done. Everybody go back to normal life. I mean, it's going to be an ongoing, painstaking, gradual process. And I, I do think it has to take place on multiple levels. 
yet there are there is some need of of legal reform uh, where laws are obstacles to progress. There is need of institutional reform and thoughtfulness and intentionality. And just as one example, you know, among ever since the time of Dr. King and even prior to him, that as he said, the most segregated hour of the week is Sunday morning. And so the, the Christian church has a lot of work to be done in this area. And then individually, just sort of doing an inventory of ourselves and what are my social circles? What am I cutting myself off from? And I would say, you know, one person. Uh, realizing a, a path to diversify their own circle and to expose themselves to a life experience that has otherwise been foreign to them, that is racial reconciliation. It's not something where we say, oh, now our work is done, but it is racial reconciliation. I, I don't think, you know, we're all striving for what King called the beloved community. The fact that we haven't arrived at it does not make the labor for incremental movement toward it, uh, anything other than than worthwhile. So it's uh, and it's not to excuse half measures, but we we have to take small, modest victories, one relationship at a time. You know, Cassandra. You know, as, as Robert was talking, it reminded me of uh, the the wonderful um, symposium that we had in Norfolk State uh, with the Plessy versus Ferguson families. Uh, it was a discussion uh, where the descendants of Plessy and Ferguson were was on our campus, and they were discussing how their descendants and, and decision impacted them. And I was really moved by Justice Taney's descendant, the one who wrote uh, the famous legal words now uh, that I believe is the, the, the quote that really kicked off the Civil War. There are no rights that any black man has that any white man is bound to respect. And, and, and he said, he said, look, I'm, I, I'm a retired advertisement executive. And I can tell you now with, with, with my group of colleagues, he doesn't really see any change coming, but he sees hope with his grandchildren. Cassandra, with that backdrop, what do you think is needed for the U.S. to have reconciliation? I think that we do ourselves a disservice by staying in our snow globes. Um, our country is strongest when we interact with each other. Um, what I have seen over the past 50 years really is an appropriation of African-American culture and accomplishments so that uh, you have these sort of white Southern uh, culinary artists and chefs coming out and claiming recipes that come from African Americans and making millions of dollars off of those recipes instead of saying, you know what, I'm part of a society and a culture that interacted with each other where whether it was forced or whether it was voluntary, there was a merging of these different cultures that produced things that we all enjoy and bringing people to a bigger table. We're still with these small tables uh, where it's mine, my, mine. mine. Um, this is not mine, my, mine, mine. America was never designed to be a country that was small. It was, it was thought of, it was envisioned to be a large country. Now, initially for the English who were coming over and conquering different areas in, in what we call the United States of America, they envisioned something small, but quickly they understood that they were not going to succeed if they stayed in their small little bubble. In fact, here in Virginia in 1622, they found out they were all gonna be killed if they stayed in their little bubble. And after that, they began to, they recognized that they had to bring many of the native peoples into their larger tent. And that tent had to get bigger and bigger. Now, of course, we know that people's rights and privileges were abused as they were brought into that big tent. 
but they realized still that their TED had to be big and it had to include a lot of these individuals. And then we went back to our safe spaces of marginalizing people because power, money, greed went hand in hand. And that meant that, you know, you wanted to hold everything for yourself. I think, as I said, we're better, we're stronger, and we are far more um, alive and feel far more secure when our tent is large. Right now, you hear the same kind of rhetoric that you heard in the 1970s and 80s, that you heard in the 1950s, going back further, you heard in the 1920s, in the throughout the antebellum period, and before that of, you know, fear of black people because black people are this horde that's going to terrorize your communities. They're gonna kill all the white people they can get. And so you have to have your Bible and your gun to protect yourself. And this is such old, old rhetoric and no one is brave enough to come out from within that camp and say, this is not working. You know, I'm reminded of what Edmund Burke said, um, and it was part of a larger piece where he says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I think it's time that we all start being brave. When we have an opportunity and we know something is wrong within our camp, that we should speak out. And that's what Latoya was talking about, that part of being bold and brave. Speak out and speak up because it is not enough any longer to stay in your safe space so that you're welcomed and accepted by everyone else. Our survival depends upon us being bold and being brave, speaking up and working towards a larger camp, a larger tent that is much more inclusive and honest and interacting with one another. Because really when we fear fear as, as uh, the, excuse me, as uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. Fear causes you to run into a burning building as opposed to out of it because you cannot have logic and fear operating in the same space. And so for our nation, we really first must understand that our tent must be large, it must be inclusive, and those within that tent are not people that we should be afraid of. Rather, what is our common goal and what can we do to share our accomplishments to move towards a better future? Shaylee and Latoya, you know, I have, you know, Robert and both Cassandra have mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. And we know about his, his we know his story. We know of his courage, his bravery and his boldness when many others uh, would not even stand by him. You know, he led the way, he led by example. But also what I remember is his writing of the letter from the Birmingham jail where he rebuked those that were self-righteous, but those that would not take a step toward doing good, the very mantle that they upheld. Do you believe that there are enough good people left in our society, in our cities, that can take that step forward and lead by example to bring about the reconciliation that we all hold for? Yeah, Eric, I will say to that, absolutely. And I think, you know, you using the Martin Luther King example, I've been studying Martin Luther King works so much in the last few months. And I'll say this. If Martin Luther King didn't make his actions and didn't step out, where will we be? I think about all of the civil rights legends and icons, and if they had just stayed in their comfort and waited for someone else to do it, where would we be? Or if they had the mindset of, well, this won't make a change. We won't get to place to Z, so I won't take a step and do anything where would we be? So I think as I entered this discussion, I had someone recently ask me, do I think that we will get to a place in my lifetime where there won't be any 
tension amongst races. And I'm like, no, I don't. But I am hopeful enough to think that the systems that are in place that we can make those uncomfortable, we can make those not the norm. I'll take it back to George Floyd. When I hear that, when I heard this 46 year old man on the ground crying out for his mother, it hit home for me as the mother of two black boys who will grow up to be large black men. I, I look at my six year old who's already four foot two and my, my dad is six, six, my husband is six, two. So I'm like, well, when will my cute little boys cross over and be seen as angry black men? And I said, even if I needed to be selfish, do I think there's gonna be a change in my lifetime? I don't. Even if I have to be selfish and say that my reason for acting is because I wanna change for my children and for my grandchildren, if that's what it takes. But I, I truly believe that it's not just, it's, it's not because I, I think it's gonna be abolished in my lifetime, but I think that we can make changes and make it uh, feel uncomfortable. I know we want to get Shelly's perspective here, but I was going to read a little bit more from the final chapter because what I say at the final chapter is learn to do right. This is Isaiah 117. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. And then I end by saying this book will not solve the racism problem. Racism is a sin problem and evil will continue. The goal of this book is to start a dialogue towards a broader solution. So I pray that, and, and I'm kind of skipping ahead, but I say, I pray that you've had some aha moment in, in your time reading the book. And then I'm gonna skip down and I say, while we may never wipe out racism, we can make it unacceptable, not the norm, not something deeply embedded. And we can continue to work towards dismantling it. We must educate ourselves about racism. We cannot ignore it and its impact. A lack of tolerance needs to be the new normal. We need these collective dialogues to see the systemic changes and ensure that racism is ultimately dismantled. So again, do I think that this is gonna wipe it out? No, I don't think that it's gonna wipe it out, but I do think that we can educate ourselves in one discussion at a time. The final thing I'll add is I, I said to someone, you may not even see the, the end result. I might have a discussion with someone from a place of love and I might be responsible for solely planting the seed. It might not be my job to see this that tree grow or to see them actually have their change or their transformation, but I've done my job by planting the seed. So if nothing else, even if this book is seed planting for people, even if someone reads this book and the seed is planted and there's not change for another decade, another two decades, I'm okay with that because I think that it's, it's in everyone's uh, change and processes happens on different terms. I don't think that we're going to wake up on Wednesday after the election and then all of a sudden everyone be in this harmonious state. No, it's, it's a process for people and it's a different process, different timing for people. Shaley, do you, do you think we have enough good people ready to take that book step forward? There's an example right there. What a, what a brave thing you did to write about your personal experience and um, share a vision forward um, from your point of view, from your belief system, from your spirituality. I think that that's a kind of authentic uh, leadership that we're all yearning for. All of us are yearning for that. Uh, and I think, um, I think that we are good people. I think that the problem is that we need to start calling out um, uh, institutions of commerce, institutions of media, institutions of um, government that actually thrive on disconnecting us from each other and ultimately from our true self. I think we, I think we all yearn and have an uh, ability, all, almost all, have, have this yearning to be truly um, connected to each other. And I think that, that there is a very powerful force that thrives from our disconnect and we need to start calling that force out wherever we see it. Um, so yes, I absolutely believed um, in this vision forward. And I think that we, I totally also, I also agree that we need to be clear headed about it. We need to not be played. We need to be really see that the forces that, um, you know, to not accept um, little efforts to actually shore up the institutions that are marketing themselves as reform, but to really be clear headed and own our own power individually so that we can collectively um, build together. Um, and I think there, 
Yes, absolutely. There are many people yearning for this. You know, we mentioned the bold steps that Dr. King made. Um, we've talked about the ability to, to really speak out and to address social ills, but so many people look at fear as an obstacle. So many people look at just, just not knowing what will happen. And sometimes it's shame because racism, discrimination, those acts are shameful within itself. We have a question asking, why is it so difficult for America and more specifically white Americans to look beyond shame and guilt and be so defensive when it comes to dealing with systems of systematic racism or our own history as a country? And does this stand in the way of true reconciliation? I'm gonna jump in. I just think a lot of people don't know their history. That's, that's the first thing. And because of that, um, their, their in sense of entitlement, their sense of who they are, uh, their sense of power is built on this false narrative that they hold, that they cling to. And they're unwilling uh, because you're asking people to give up a position of rightfulness, a position of I, I'm the true American. I'm the one whose claim, you know, who, who has a rightful claim to this. And you're asking people, I shouldn't say to give it up, but to share it to acknowledge that it must be shared, that they were not alone in helping to build this country and helping to move uh, uh, all the people forward. And that, that the country was not pristine. You know, I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, our government has never um, called on someone to be killed. And I'm, you know, in my mind, my head just about explodes because I can think of so many examples of when this country, these states would put a dead, a warrant, you know, a bounty, dead or alive. When David Walker wrote his appeal and published it in 1829, most of the Southern states call for him to die. Dead or alive, they wanted him dead because he had the audacity to to use the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence as an indictment on American society, not holding up to his ideals, and then encouraging African Americans to take their freedom by force if necessary, just as, as the white Americans took their freedom by force from England. And, and so we, we still have this, this disconnection, I believe, between what people understand their past to be about and how they built their, their ideas and their egos on that and the reality. But there's also another thing, and that is the reality is we still have ongoing racism. We still have systematic racism in our built in, as many people have already said, built into our systems, but people are practicing racism, whether they realize it or not. When I look at the military and the officer corps and who becomes a colonel, who becomes a general or an admiral, depends upon the people making recommendations on what are they basing it? Are, are they basing it on purely um, the person's ability to do a job, or are they basing it on this individual continuing a certain mindset and policy that I believe is relevant and often that's race-based. And so we, we still have a lot of that transpiring. We still have a lot of the decisions. In fact, in Virginia, they have had case after case of people uh, applying for jobs and with the, the same resume, the same background, and yet nine times out of 10, that white candidate is selected over the black candidate. So there's still that going on time and time again. Robert, I, I saw your microphone coming as well. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I, I do think um, sometimes the language we use uh, can 
can uh, contribute to uh, defensiveness. I, I do think one area of progress we've had in the country over the last 50 years is stigmatizing conscious bias based on skin color, right? And that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It still exists, but there is a much stronger stigma around that now than there was before. And so one of the things that I find is for, for, for some white Americans, it's, it's hard to get to a conversation about systemic racism because they're conscious of the fact that they would not object to someone of a different skin color coming over to their house for dinner, right? I think that's a, a, an area where we have actually made progress. And so what I say is, well, let's call it whatever you want to call it, right? But let's just look at the reality and look at the facts and un unpack the facts and the history. And then you can use a different label if you want. But I, I do think that I, I do think we have to be careful with the labels um, because uh, if if you're if if there's a perception that we're leading with stigma it's not going to be a very fruitful conversation. And so I do think we have to become even more precise about distinguishing between personal conscious bias and the legacies of, of uh, systemic, explicit, deliberate efforts to marginalize Black Americans, unconscious bias that persists to the day on many levels, and the lingering effects of all of this that contributes to the marginalization of African Americans today, even if a white American would say, no, I, I wouldn't object to a black neighbor coming over to my house for dinner. I'm not racist, right? That, so, so the language gets very muddled and it can, it can facilitate a reaction more of shame and defensiveness than opening to a clear-eyed understanding of reality and history. Latoya, in, in, in your feedback, have you received any feedback from someone who's non-Black non that have expressed shame or guilt or been defensive? You know, Eric, I have not received that kind of feedback directly, but I was conscious of that when I wrote my book. I don't want anyone to feel shame or guilt. And like I said earlier, the quote that I use is, again, history is not our fault, but making a change in the future is our duty. It's our job. It's our obligation. And so I'm going to segue into talking about someone else's book, actually. I'm going to talk a little bit about White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. And I think that her book is spot on and hits on a lot of good points. But when I read her reviews, she has some one-star reviews. And I think personally that those one star reviews probably didn't even read her book. They got caught on the title, right? It's a book called White Fragility. If you ever hear her speak, you hear her talk about the fragileness, the fragileness of white people. And to me, I don't want to be stereotyped and categorized in one big jump jumbled lump together as a black woman, as a black person. So I don't think it's fair that we do that to white people. I don't think it's fair that we do it to any person. So I think that exactly as uh, Dean Vischer just stated, I don't want anyone to feel that they're being attacked. That's counterproductive. We're not going to get anywhere. And that, that doesn't mean that we don't tell history. That doesn't mean that we don't go through the truth of history. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be uh, in an antagonistic name calling, blaming, fashion. And again, while I think that Robin D'Angelo hits on a lot of truths in that book, the white fragility, the title there gets a lot of people caught up and they're uncomfortable and unable to move past it. Um, one of the questions I ask in the book, I said there at the end of the book, there are the top 10 questions. And one of the questions I point out is, this topic makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about it. So I say you, you have your ground rules and we don't have to talk about white, we don't have to call it white privilege. Like we can talk about the truth and the systems that are in place without having to keep saying white privilege, white, white fragility, or any words if a person who's in my growth group or in my circle has vulnerably expressed to me that those words make them or those phrases make them feel uncomfortable. I think that their feelings and experiences are valid and I will want them to respect if I say, I don't want you to call me an angry black woman or I don't want you to put a stereotype on me or a stigma on me. I need you to respect that as we're growing together in this space. 
you know, we, we all, one thing I've, I've been hearing is that we're at a point where we need to discuss this. We need to have this. From a historical, legal, and practical view, why do you believe it's so important in our history at this time that we get it right as it relates to re racial reconciliation? Cassandra? It's been 400 years. And I think there's something important about 400 years. Um, there are so many generations, but uh, you know, I, I, I think about the, the, the length of time in, in America's arc where we started and where we are today, that there's something special about those 400 years. And now it's time we've, we've gone through all of these, these episodes of, of, of exter you know, attempted extermination of native peoples, of, of enslavement, of African peoples, of, of segregation and discrimination and all kinds of things. And we've been denying at every turn its impact on those individuals that we're harming. In fact, we've created a whole body of literature that supports and validates that, always blaming the victim for their victimization. But now we're at a point where we're looking very differently at ourselves, at our world, at who we are. And I think it's so important that we continue on that journey of discovery, of discovering who we are. But this time, let's discover ourselves together. I remember that at the beginning of the century, um, the census, uh, for the first time, for the first time acknowledged, oh, there are people who are mixed in America. Oh my God. Oh, shocking, shocking. It's like, I'm sorry. But the first time a European man came to this continent, you had mixtures. Let us start there. A acknowledge that our history is complicated. And I like what ancestry is doing. It is it is pulling us all together because when I look at my family DNA and, and my seventh cousins twice removed or whatever, and I'm seeing all, I'm seeing people from all different walks of life and from different continents. What it tells me is that we are complicated and complications make us interesting. And it makes us go on this path of discovery. And instead of running from that complication, we need to run towards the complication because that's who we really are. We're not good or evil. We're just complicated with a little bit of a lot of stuff all mixed in. And that's America. And, and I, I, I enjoy that. I, the most boring thing to me are these one dimensional characters in literature. I wanna see the complications because that's the reality of who we are. And I want to encourage people to join me in finding those complications so that possibly we can find out that we are related if we go back far enough. And that's really where history and where we are today is possible because of our technology that it's allowed us to make these connections that were only whispered as, as one generation was passing on and if they would whisper who you were related to, now we can find out and confirm those. And we'll find that I think our connections are deep and they're embedded in our history and our society and our culture. And once we do, I think that our present and our future will be very different, but informed by our past, but very different from our past. Shaley, why do you think it's important in this time of our history that we get it right or just try? So I, I taught recently a law school seminar and we started with the Rodney King arrest and the students were all younger than Rodney King's than how long ago Rodney King was uh, beaten. And we really dived pretty deeply into the trial, the change of venues, the, um, the police actions that um, 
through fuel to a fire. Um, there was there was it was a very interesting historical journey through um, a politic a similar moment in time. Um, then we when we talked about Michael Brown, um, we read the Ferguson report and we thought about all the wisdom that was in there about what causes this um, feeling of uh, disconnect with community and law enforcement, the fining of people, the bench warrants, the limited amount of time the courts were open, the whole, you know, the whole culture of a community that led to a young man lying there dead in the middle of the street for six hours, just like horror, just like if you're part of a civilization that this happens and you cannot not be jarred by the reality of where you live. I mean, it, it's just the core value of human beings um, being showcased as absent, right? So, so, so the, 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 the reason we must get it now is because imagine being a young person and this is your history. And again and again, you've been shown this, this uh, intersection of, um, yes, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly, thank you. Uh, we must get it right because to not get it right is um, the worst things can happen, which is that our young people be can become cynical. And they can lose hope in our ability to make changes that are effective. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Robert, Robert, you're up. Why is it important we get it right? Two minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, one thing is just demographics. Uh, the country is changing and it's becoming more diverse and white people are going to no longer be a, a majority. And there's a couple of choices. We can embrace the diversity or we can become more tribal and uh, resistant and reluctant and reactive. And uh, it might change over generations as a matter of course, but I think it can be helped along in that process by proactive grassroots deliberate conversations. And it's one reason why I think uh, Latoya's book is so helpful is because she wrote it as a conversation. You read it and it's not someone laying out this formal teaching, it's someone telling their story and just sitting down with you over a cup of coffee to talk to you about it and answer the questions you might have very candidly. So I think it's a, it's a helpful book for the cultural moment we're in right now. Toya, this is your moment, this is your time. How can we be bold? Yes, so I think, again, I want to thank everyone for accepting my invitation to serve tonight as panelists. And like I said, I think that the journey to becoming bold, it's a group effort. You have to examine yourself. And like I encourage you to do in the book, you get you a growth group to be able to grow together and do life with. There are a lot of different perspectives on the call tonight. But I think that one thing is for sure, we all want to see a change. So I can say for me, writing this book, took boldness for me and this is only the beginning and the question that you posed Eric was you know can we afford to not get it right my, my answer is no we can't we cannot there's too much at stake for us to not do it so I would challenge everyone to not sit silently anymore figure out how you can be a resource how you can be bold nothing is too small nothing is too small and the comment was just made about technology we are in a different place. You, we have access to so many resources. You can get on Google and find out any history you want to find. If you don't want to read, you can find videos. You can find webinars to listen to. You can find so much information and so many resources at your fingertips. So I'm so humbled for this opportunity to be the one to put this out, uh, out there. And I'm just looking forward to getting all of the feedback and reviews from everyone. And more so what I'm hoping to hear is the comments that my heart has been changed, my mind has been changed, and I've been being bold. So I, I certainly appreciate everyone attending tonight, and I appreciate each and every panelist for taking the time to have this night, this opportunity with us tonight. And thank you for moderating, Eric. <laughs> no problem, my, my, my dear friend. Well, there you have it. We could have this conversation all night. Robert, Cassandra, Shaley, LaToya, you've added so much to this conversation of our time in history in our country. But as you stated, the time is now to be bold. We want all of you to get LaToya's book. You can go to the bowl, LaToyaBorrell.com. Any 
uh, Amazon or any book outlet and get Be Bold. And we want you to look at yourself, start the journey inside and move outward, but not just by yourself, but take someone with you. But the first step to any journey begins with you. This has been the virtual launch of Be Bold. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks. Everyone have a good night.